and you're there, so welcome. But delighted to have everyone who is here with us today. Please uh, be sure and read over your worship folder and look at items in there that uh, are there by way of announcement. I do want to highlight a few things, though, so please uh, don't take this to be an exhaustive listing of things, uh, as you can see on the screens and, again, in your bulletin, items of importance. Uh, please, if you have not before, left behind a record of yourself and of attendance and how we can contact you, we would love to be able to do that, not because we want to send you unwanted spam, but we just would like to have a means of being in contact with you, and if you're willing to do that, please fill out a welcome card and drop it in the offering plate. No obligation, though. If you fail to do that, nobody's going to say any word to you. Uh, we would just like to have it. I do need to emphasize that this coming Tuesday, January 2nd, we've got two things going on. One is at 9 o'clock in the morning. We're going to take down the decorations for, uh, for Christmas, and we need help with that. So please plan to come on Tuesday morning at 9 for however long you can. We should be done by lunchtime at the, at the most. But for any amount of time, we would love to have your services. So that will be Tuesday, 9 o'clock. The other thing happens that evening at 6 o'clock, and that is uh, choir rehearsal. At least I think that's the case. Am I right? You are absolutely right, Pastor. 6 o'clock, right here in this room, choir practice. Glad to be right every once in a while. Uh, anyone's welcome at choir rehearsal again this Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, on Thursday, not this coming one, but the following, January the 11th, we will begin a new series uh, of a Bible class that will be examining the book of Ecclesiastes. Mike Novak will be leading that class, and uh, Lord willing, next Sunday he'll be up here and tell you a little bit more about that. But I do want to give you a heads up now so you can be planning. On Thursday evenings at 6.30, anyone and everyone is welcome to come and be a part of that Bible class. Next Sunday, January 7th, of course, we will begin two morning services. This is the last of the season that we'll be meeting uh, only at 10 o'clock. So beginning next week, we will have morning services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then the following Sunday, in addition to those two services, we will begin an evening service at 6 p.m. in which we will be uh, dealing with a very special topic that will focus on Christ in the Old Testament. So be aware of that. Next Sunday we go to two morning services and then the following we will add a 6 p.m. service as well. Ladies, your Bible study that normally is on Wednesdays will resume on January 10th, so a week from this Wednesday. So those are the things I have to emphasize. I apologize if I'm overlooking anything, and I know that we're not at prayer requests, but uh, I do want to mention uh, two things. Becky Ham has been in the hospital this past week. She is at home recovering from pancreatitis, and Carl and Becky, we are praying for you. And also, I just learned this morning that uh, from, uh, some, from Randy Riddle, who contacted one of our members, that Linda is in the hospital. So let's please remember that. But uh, Dr. Gregg will be coming up to pray about pastoral concerns later. In the meantime, we have a special guest with us here today. Well, we've got a lot of special guests. Uh, all of you are uh, very special to us. But uh, we have someone here from the Northern Climes. I understand that there are, there are colleges in the state of Michigan. And uh, there's one in particular at which we have an RUF campus minister. And its colors are blue and gold, that's all I'm going to say, but uh, at any rate, we've got Robert Knuth here, and I thought since he was in town, he ought to come give us an update, because we're partnering with them. Yes, sir. What's that? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Maize and blue. Maize and blue. Well, you know. You're giving announcements, and I thought you were going to announce that tomorrow at 5 p.m. You know, it's part of the... Um, if I have not met you, my name is Robert Knuth. Like uh, Patrick said, I'm the RUF campus minister at the University of Michigan, and 
Uh, I realize that my, I don't know how familiar some of you guys are with RUF. Uh, it stands for Reformed University Fellowship. It's our denominations campus ministry. We're on for 180 campuses across the world. Um, I started RUF at the University of Michigan the year 2019, so this is our fifth year on campus. And one of the things I get really excited to, to talk about when I kind of come before churches is putting before you guys the question of what's it look like to bring renewal to the country, to the world? Um, we believe that God's mission to the world is through his church, that it's important to be a member of a local church, to invest in the church. And one of the things I really love about RUF, I came to faith through RUF in college at a small little school in Virginia called Washington Lee University. I love that RUF, uh, we call ourselves the food truck of the local church. <laughs> so you have the restaurant, which is Bay Pres, right? Um, and, and surrounding churches and what's called a presbytery. And the presbytery sends this mission out onto campus as an arm of the church, you could say. And so I'm a pastor. Just like Patrick, I'm ordained in, in the PCA, and um, what's great about that is we as the church get an opportunity to go to the next generation, and we get to say that God is still here with you. God has not forsaken you. Um, in fact, I, I, you know, I'm the campus guy, right, so I'm going to say this. I think this is one of the greatest opportunities in the world to see our, our country renewed. Why? Uh, because every student uniformly, whether they are Christian, agnostic, atheist, whatever, they're all asking the same question. They're all asking the question of, who am I? Uh, how does what I believe going to affect the rest of my life? Uh, how does what I believe going to affect who I marry and just the things that come down the road? Every student is asking that when they come to campus at the University of Michigan. And so I want to put before you, I need three supporters uh, this next uh, calendar year to reach our, our uh, budget. Uh, send out a weekly text thread, quick ways you can pray, send out a monthly newsletter. Uh, and the opportunity before us at the University of Michigan is that this is no ordinary school. Uh, this is consistently ranked in the top three uh, of public schools across the country. Uh, but it's also ranked in the kind of top 10 most secular uh, progressive uh, schools in the country at the same time. And so there's this, there's this gap. And I need you, church family, I need you to be lifting us up because the Lord has already done miraculous things in our midst. Uh, really, you told me three to four minutes. So I'm going to share one story really quickly. Um, uh, this year, there's a, a senior um, young man named Duncan who's gotten involved in our ministry. Duncan is from Gilbert, Arizona. He came to campus, uh, not a Christian. His parents had just gotten divorced, um, a really messy divorce that was uh, affecting him and his brother, and he quickly got involved in the fraternity life. In fact, the divorce got so messy that he uh, went and lived in the Netherlands for seven months just to get away from his family. And uh, getting to that point, he traveled the Atlantic Ocean. And um, similar to John Newton, uh, the famous slave trader who turned um, Christian evangelist, apologist, wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace, who was converted on the high seas. Uh, Duncan, my student, was converted on the high seas of the Atlantic Ocean when a friend of his opened the Bible with him. And as they're going through the Bible, um, the, such good news, Duncan didn't know what to do with it. He was like, what, how, what do I do next? <laughs> and his friend Max said, well, if you go back to campus, if there's an RUF, you need to get involved. And Duncan has been involved. He uh, is leading our cross-cultural ministry efforts. This young man wants to go into ministry. Um, potentially even the REF internship. And uh, this is just a, a quick little story of how God has renewed um, students' lives. I'm doing a wedding next weekend. My first students are getting married. Um, it's only a five-year-old ministry, right? And so they're just getting out of college. My students are getting married. And this one, the bride next week in St. Louis, we're driving there. I got my wife and three kids. It's going to be really fun. But, um, <laughs> but the bride, her freshman year comes in and she goes, uh, I'm never getting married. I was like, why? Okay. Um, why is that? And she was like, yeah, I don't like what the Bible has to say about marriage. I'm just not going to do that. I was like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> and we keep meeting, we keep meeting. And uh, by the time she's a junior um, on our leadership retreat, she tells me, she says, Robert, if it wasn't for RUF, um, I wouldn't be a Christian. And if I wasn't a Christian, um, I would have become a man a long time ago. Or I would have tried to become a man a long time ago. This woman wrestling with gender um, identity and, and what it looks like to be a woman in this uh, transforming world, right? And um, she's getting married next weekend to a man who um, is an RUF intern, and uh, potentially, you know, the husband wants to go into ministry himself. And so 
I could talk more. I will be in the back over here afterward. Like I said, I would love to add you to our prayer um, text thread, our newsletters, any way I can kind of give you frontline reports of what God is doing. Uh, don't believe the news. The Lord is bringing renewal, and um, it, is, it is really miraculous and exciting to be a part of. I would love to, to add you to our team. So thanks, Patrick. Well, clearly that was a mistake. I'm supposed to preach after that. <laughs> thank you, brother. That was an absolutely wonderful report. As we thank God for his work in all places. Maze, that's okay with me. <laughs> well, we are here to worship the Lord. We've already heard a good report. There's every reason in the world out of thanksgiving to worship the one true and living God. So let's prepare our hearts and minds to do that together right now. Good morning, church family. Good I have to lower this. There are a lot of tall men around here. <laughs> Our responsive reading today, calling God to worship with us, is Psalm 96. Please join me in reading responsibly. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. For God is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. And so we sing, to God be the glory. Stand with me as we make a joyful noise unto him.
Heavenly Father, as we look forward in faith to this new year, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and hope. Your steadfast love and faithfulness have been our anchor in times past. And in faith, we trust they will be our guide in the days to come. Lord, through your prophet Jeremiah, your word promises that you have plans for us, plans for good and not for evil, to give us a future and a hope. And as we navigate the unknowns of this new year, help us to cling to these promises, finding peace in your providential care. Grant us the wisdom to discern your will in every situation. May we be instruments in your hands, <clears throat> embodying your love and grace to those we encounter. Help us to be a light in the darkness of this hurting culture, reflecting the hope that is found in Christ. In moments of challenge or uncertainty, remind us of your promise in Deuteronomy that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and that your presence is constant. Strengthen our faith that we may trust in you with all our heart, leaning not on our own understanding, but in every way acknowledging you, confident that you will make our paths straight. Be with us now as we seek to glorify you in our worship, our prayers, singing, and hearing of your word. Bless this year, O oh Lord, and make us fruitful witnesses for your kingdom. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. But when the set time has fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. He was indeed known under the law because of his Jewish doctrine. This is the reading of the word of God. Philippians 4, 4 through 20. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. 
And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left, no Ma when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. We have our ushers come forward. We have the joy now in this part of our worship service in returning our tithes and offerings to God. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as we gather to present our offerings, we do so with hearts full of gratitude and worship. We reflect back on this year and your once again constant goodness in providing all that we needed. Our gifts, small as they may seem in your kingdom, are the tangible expression of our thankfulness and commitment to living faithfully in your Lord, we recognize that everything we have comes from you, our provider and sustainer. In giving back a portion of what you have so generously given us, we acknowledge your lordship over all aspects of our lives. May these offerings be used to further your kingdom, to spread your message of love and grace, and to meet the needs of those less fortunate. May our giving be an act of worship and a testament to our faith in your providence, provision, and promises, as well as tangible evidence of our belief in the stewardship of believers. In all things, we seek to glorify you, O Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Usually at this point, we have something we call special music, which means that somebody gets to share his or her testimony of what the Lord is doing in their life. But, you know, it's a hymn sing today, and you get to choose your favorite hymns. So the, the hymn book is in front of you somewhere, and if you're in the back, uh, there's a rack of them that you may get up and get one if you don't have one within arm's reach. But uh, choosing a hymn and then just calling it out, and then we'll sing of it. And we, of course, don't want to get rowdy about it. But um, we're going to include Christmas, too, because I know I'm not quite through. Last night I went to, uh, went to sleep singing Christmas carols. So even though Christmas is over with, it's not quite in my heart yet over with. So if you want to include those Christmas carols, they're around 138, 140, whatever. You've got the first hymn that they'd like to call out. Call a number and we'll sing it. Oh, Holy Night. Oh, Holy yes. Night. Somebody find it. We'll find it. 148. What is it? Thank you. 148. That's one of the ones I listened to last night. And somebody oh, else yeah. asked for that earlier. We'll remain seated. 148. Oh, Holy Night. Here we go. Oh, Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining.
473? Is that what I heard? Way back there? You got better ears than me. 473. Whoa. 473. Victory in Jesus. <laughs> stand up and do this. Three, four, three. seven. Three. 
347, did you For say? Becky and the Runs, be still my soul. 347. You know what? Let's remain standing. I think we can do that. 347. It always took me longer as I was growing up to find the right page. I could play it on piano, but I couldn't find it. 347? Yes. Oh, I'm in the chorus. Not mine. I found it. <laughs> I'm usually the slow one. Yeah. Three. 46, 347. Here we go. Here we go. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief. This is the church that knows how to sing, praise God. <laughs> Brings tears to my eyes, and I mean in a good way. <laughs> Took you a moment. <laughs> As I look around, I see visitors welcome to you. You may think that you're here by accident or by chance, and as we studied this morning, there, there is no chance. So delighted you are here and that God has willed your presence. If you would, take out the prayer sheets that are in the bulletin. We have much to pray for, church. There are precious members of this fellowship who are suffering. And I want us to especially remember Becky, Linda, Pastor Patrick mentioned, Ron Bolson and Ron Kellums. And others, uh, dare I mention them all, there, there are many of them listed here. So pick out a few of those, and if you would, uh, pray, and let's pray fervently. Lord Jesus, Lord, we totally depend upon you. We depend upon your providence in our life. We depend upon your healing, for you are the great physician and Lord, there are those in our fellowship who are suffering. And we pray, Lord, we beg you, touch them. Give them the peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, would you be so gracious as to restore them, to bring them back present with us, that we might rejoice together and together hear their testimony of your goodness and faithfulness. Lord, we pray for those who stand on the ramparts. For those who stood guard Christmas Eve will stand guard tonight and who are prepared to rescue us when we need rescue from accident or harm. We pray for those who are healers, for the doctors and nurses and pharmacists and respiratory technicians. Lord, even those in our fellowship who perform those very roles. Lord, we pray for those who directly intervene in this hurting and broken, distorted culture. Lord, thank you for RUF. Thank you for Lucas. Thank you for Robert, whom we've heard from and other RUF pastor, campus pastors that we've been privileged to share prayer concerns with. 
Pray for the Pregnancy Resource Center. We pray, pray for all, Inc., all of those organizations, Lord, organized under your providence who seek to be the hands and feet of your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, would you be good to all of them? Would you show us, Lord, and grant us increased faith that even today, we would remember these individuals, that we would pray as a matter of habit throughout the day for these individuals. And Lord, once again, please restore to this fellowship those of our members who are hurting. We ask this in your precious name, confident that indeed your promises that all things work together for good for those who are called by him. In Jesus' name, we place our trust in these prayers. Amen. I'm sorry, I know somebody, I think, wanted to sing in the garden over here, and I apologize. We couldn't get to all of those songs. And if you'll indulge me for just a moment, uh, my mother-in-law, Nancy, was not able to log in and watch online this morning, so she's FaceTiming me right now. <laughs> Everybody tell her hello. And pray for her because she's getting a close-up look of her son-in-law. <laughs> and giving her reason again to question her daughter's wisdom. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, oh, poinsettias. If you want a poinsettia, today is your day. These are available for you after the service, but you need to get them today because come Tuesday when we, de when we take down decorations, these will go away. So if you want poinsettias, come pick them up, and nobody's going to check and see if, you know, it's associated with you in any way. If you pick it up and take it out, it's yours. How's that, Linda? Does that cover it? She gave me a thumbs up. Wow. Somebody said I got it right this morning, and Linda gave me a thumbs up. I'm good. <laughs> All right, and my mother-in-law is still on, so that's even better. <laughs> Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, in the time that we have, as we come back to our series, The Doctor Has Good News, I do so because I believe. This is a wonderful text for us on the cusp of this new year. As we think about who we ought to be and what we ought to be doing, and I know that many people focus on New Year's resolutions that you may or may not keep, and I'm not getting into that. There is something that ought to be a priority in all of our lives, and that is prayer. We looked previously, before we stopped and went into the Thanksgiving and Advent season, where Jesus teaches how to pray and gives us what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Luke gives us an abbreviated version of it. We have the fuller version in Matthew. But even so, having given us that prayer, he now goes on to give them particular instruction with, with regard to the way in which we ought to pray. So let's look together. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, reminding you that this is the word of God. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence or his persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father 
give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And so we bless the Lord for his word and thank him as we again acknowledge the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Amen. How are you spending your time? How many of you have been asked that question? I remember in class when one particular student said he had been too busy to do his homework over the weekend, and, and as I was watching this take place in this particular class, and it being my friend who was sitting not too far from me, was the one who had said he was too busy to get his homework done. The teacher asked, well, how did you spend your time over the weekend? I won't give you his answer. The teacher did not give him an excuse, and uh, he learned a valuable lesson, as others of us did watching. But how do you spend your time? As we look at this new year coming up, we're mindful, of course, that a whole year lies before us that Jesus tarries. And I pray more earnestly than ever that he does not. I would love for him to return. But even so, we have what appears to be a year ahead of us, What should be our priority and how should we spend our time? What we learn is that uh, prayer, of course, should be a priority in the life of a believer. Jesus, after all, takes a significant amount of time to teach on this. When asked by a disciple, or rather when it was requested of him, if he would teach them how to pray, he actually takes the time to do that, which tells us that we need instruction in the matter. There are those in the world today who would say that you don't need to be instructed in prayer, just do it. But if Jesus is our teacher and our guide, he begs to differ, and so we should listen to what he says. He makes clear that we need to pray and that we need instruction in prayer. As a Puritan has said that I've quoted before and I've long forgotten which one it was who said it, the one who lives without Prayer in this life lives without God in this life. There are few things that demonstrate that you truly have faith than that you are a person of prayer. After all, you have to believe that God exists, that he's there, that he really is there, even though he is invisible to our physical eyes. In prayer, we're acknowledging he is there. Lord, I do believe in you. Not only do I believe in you, but I'm talking to you right now as I praise your name and acknowledge you and and adore your name. That's one of the ways that we express that our faith is genuine and not just some intellectual assent. Like, you know, God can be there in the, in the same way that Pluto is out there in our solar system somewhere. I can't see it. I've never touched it. I haven't been there. But I know it's there because smart people and strong telescopes, powerful ones, demonstrate that it's there. But prayer is our way of acknowledging. Lord, I do believe in you. You are a part of my life. After all, what kind of relationship could you have with someone if you only every once in a while looked in their direction and never talked to them? What kind of relationship could you have with a spouse or a child or a family member or anyone else if you you never spoke to them? God has spoken to us through his word. He has communicated to us most perfectly through the person of his son, the word that has become flesh as we've acknowledged in this Advent season. And he, having spoken to us, having communicated himself to us, asks of us to speak to him. Note how the Lord Jesus is our example, as we've already seen when we were in Luke chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. As Jesus was beginning to experience what we might call fame, as word about him was spreading abroad, And how even more the report about him went abroad. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He went off to be by himself to pray in private. The point is this. If the sinless, perfect, holy, righteous son of God needed to withdraw to a private place to pray, you can bet that we do. We must be a people of prayer. It is a way in which we acknowledge our need of God and place our dependence on him. But there's always that nagging temptation toward autonomy, isn't there? You know, I want to fix this. I want to be the one who's able to bring about the remedy. Yet in prayer, we're acknowledging I am not God. He is, and I need him. 
Yes, indeed. One of his disciples, other disciples at other times said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he gave instruction. We use the Lord's Prayer and worship services on Sunday mornings because it is a pattern for us to follow, not just on Sunday, but all the time, to take seriously how the Lord teaches and instructs us so that as we go about praying, we go about doing it in the right way, and we do it in a persistent way. So prayer is our lifeline, our lifeline for requesting genuine needs agreeable to God's will. It's important to get those things together. As we look at this, and by the way, in the parentheses, when it says 5 through 6, that's referring to verses 5 and 6 in Luke chapter 11. We see this demonstrated when he asked the question, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves? For what reason? Because he has company, has guests in his house who need to eat. He doesn't have enough to feed them. So Right off the bat, this is not a trivial matter. You know, this is not the neighbor going next door and saying, you know, hey, uh, Florida State needs help in this game. Not to diminish those types of prayers, as I've made three-fourths of you very angry at me right now. <laughs> or other things. Lord, I'd like a blue car instead of a, instead of a green one. Uh, the types of things that can sometimes seemingly press in on us that seem all important. I was having a moment like that just yesterday, thinking about some matters, and then a headline popped up on my phone as I was looking, and I saw where, where over 100 Christians were killed, were murdered in Nigeria on Christmas Day by jihadists. You know, suddenly, that thing that I thought was so important became very trivial. So when we think about prayer, we need to think in terms of needs, not mere wants. And I believe that's in view here. When this neighbor goes to the other neighbor in this hypothetical situation, there's a real need there and not a trivial one. People need to eat. They would be hungry without food. And so it's a reminder to us that while the needs need to be genuine, that we take everything to the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 is a good guide for us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. As someone has paraphrased this, worry about nothing. Pray about everything. So we take everything to the Lord in the sense that not that we prioritize the trivial. We prioritize the things that are truly needful. But we take them to the Lord because we believe he is and that he answers our prayers, even when the answer is no. Prayer is a means by which we not only are living out our faith, it's a means by which we grow in our faith. And there are a few times that we grow more than when we're able to accept the answer of no to the thing that we've asked for, and yet continue to believe and trust and love the Lord and acknowledge not my will, but yours be done. Psalm 62, verse 8, enjoins us to trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So in this teaching of praying and continuing to pray and continuing to ask and to persist in prayer, we realize it's not a one and done. When somebody asks, have you prayed? Well, yeah, I did that last week, last month yesterday, an hour ago, our answer should be, yes, I prayed, and I continue to pray. So when praying for true needs, and again, remember that phrase, which is tacked on to our shorter catechism, as well as the larger one, that we pray for things in accordance with God's will. Remember, God cannot act in a way that is contrary to his character. He's not going to grant something to us that would be sinful for us, or that would otherwise result in our being led away from him. God acts in a way that is consistent with his attributes and his character. So in harmony with his will, we pray for true needs, but we can do it boldly. And as Jesus teaches in this passage, to keep on asking, to keep on seeking, and to continue knocking, verses 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. 
Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. So cultivating a life of prayer, not just moments when we pray, but a life of prayer where we strive continually to be in communication with God is absolutely an urgent need. Think about this coming new year and how you might be seeking to grow in your faith. And certainly we need to read scripture. That ought to be a priority. After all, if we're going to pray in accordance with God's will, we need to know what that revealed will is. And, and we need scripture in order to know. So the two things go together, the word and prayer. And as we immerse ourselves in scripture to seek to cultivate life of prayer so that we are every day and in every way engaging in communication with him. Think about Brother Lawrence, the monk years ago working in the monastery. You know, he didn't have a lot of time that he could pull off to himself and pray. He was having to work a lot and the clatter and clanging of dishes and pots and pans rattled throughout the kitchen where he was working. But he, he labored in what seems like a menial task to pray to the Lord even in those times, and especially in those times. Now, there's nothing like being still and knowing that he's God. There's nothing like withdrawing to a deserted place or a closet to pray. Jesus enjoins us to do that. But we need to cultivate a life of prayer so that if we're going to persist in it, we're persisting in that we are continuing to ask, continuing to seek, continuing to knock with the assurance that not only he hears us, but the way will be open before us, as this uh, example would have us believe. The, the, you know, the neighbor ends up relenting. Sure, I'll give you what you want. He's aggravated, at least by inference we, we gain it. You know, he's been disturbed in the middle of the night. I just want you to go away and go home so I can go back to bed. Here's what you want. God, of course... It's not put off when we come to him in prayer. Jesus is not teaching us about the character of the Father in this account. He's teaching us about the value of persisting in prayer. So if a neighbor out of aggravation would grant a request, how much more a heavenly Father who wants us to come into his presence and loves us, not aggravated with us, will give us what we need. One of my best friends from growing up had a granddaughter born just in the last couple of months and you know he sent me a picture that his wife took of him holding this this little granddaughter and I messaged back to him I said just go ahead and give her everything she wants now and it'll save you a lot of trouble later you know because <laughs> she clearly already has him wrapped around her tiny little finger just like our grandsons do in our case you know come up wanting something and you know, out of love, you delight in giving good things to children, to grandchildren. Our Father loves us. Yeah, Jesus is not teaching that he gets aggravated with us and says, all right, here. No, he gives because of love. And so we can pray boldly and confidently, knowing that he is our loving Heavenly Father, not an annoyed neighbor, but a loving Heavenly Father. And not only can we pray boldly because we know the, the nature of the Father and that he loves us, but he has loved us so much he has given his only son for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our atoning sacrifice for sins, the means by which we're reconciled to him and by which we're able to call him Father. Don't ever forget that. We're able to call him Father because of what Christ has done for us, because he has come to be one of us, because he yielded up his life as a sacrifice for sin and thus we have a father but we're able to come boldly into his presence Hebrews 4 and of course the book of Hebrews tells us so much about the inter intercessory work of Christ and how he mediates for us let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need I remember one time being with a with a friend and we had a particular thing and I'm going to rush through this because time's drawing to a close but we uh, you know we had a, a real need we, we had a, needed a part for a car that he was driving and so we go to the auto parts place and 
he goes up in front of everybody. There was a line there. He goes all the way up to the counter. And uh, I said, what are you doing? You're going to get us shot. <laughs> you know, justifiable homicide is still a defense in the mountains. And uh, he, he just goes right on up there. Little did I know that his uncle worked there. You know, and his uncle came out, and he said, hey, what do you need? He told him what he needed, went and got in there. All these people back there, you know, are watching this, and I still think we're going to get shot. But it made all the difference in the world. Had I gone up to the front of the counter, it would have been a whole different matter. A man would have come out and looked at me and said, get in line. But the beloved nephew came up, and suddenly we had the part we needed. Paid for it later. The Father loves us. We have a relationship with him. We can come into his presence confidently, not because <laughs> he's blessed to have us there, you know, like I'm the greatest gift that, he's ever received it has nothing to do with who I am it has everything to do with who I am in his son the Lord Jesus I'm in Christ therefore I have access so boldly yet humbly right because that boldness doesn't result or isn't the result of God being so impressed with me has everything to do with his love for his son and my being in Christ means I have this access. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Do you see that? According to his will. He's not a genie in a bottle waiting to grant us whatever wish we ask for. I've said it before. I got this from somebody years ago and so I don't want you to give me credit for it, but you can take it home with you. Can you imagine the utter chaos that would result in this world if God suddenly began to answer every prayer in the affirmative, regardless of whether it was in accordance with his word or not? Can you imagine? We can't. It's a good thing that he's revealed his will. And it's a good thing that he only acts according to his will. Yes, there are times when I wish... He would take into consideration my wisdom on particular matters. <laughs> but like a little child who has to learn that Father knows best, I by faith have to surrender myself to him and say, your will be done, but I still can come boldly and ask. You have not because you ask not. Or you ask amiss, that is, in a way that's not in accordance with his will. John 16, 27. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, the Lord Jesus says, and have believed that I came from God. So God's love poured out upon us because of his Son. So in summarizing all of this, and that's all I've done essentially, in this matter of persisting in prayer and believing that God will give us good things, you see the very apt descriptions there. You don't need them explained to you. If you ask for a fish, he's not going to give a serpent. If you ask for an egg, he's not going to give you a scorpion. There are other manuscripts that say if you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. Same principle and concept. The Father loves us and delights to give good things, and particularly as this relates to and has to do with the giving of the Holy Spirit, that means by which we are united to Christ and his work on the cross is applied to me as we seek to know him and want the Holy Spirit in our lives to work and sanctify us daily even as we have trusted in Christ. He's not going to turn us away. That's an extraordinary thing. I'm sorry, come back tomorrow. I tried to make a reservation at a restaurant just recently, you know, and they didn't have the time available that I wanted. I can't believe they weren't there at the desk just waiting for me to call so they could fill up that time slot with my name. They dared to put other people there. Our Father will never give you a busy seat. Now, the answer, as I've said, may be a no, but it's not because of a failure on his part to love you. It's not because he's, uh, he's done all he's going to do that day. 
because he loves us and he has a better plan for our lives than what we possibly can imagine. But I want to go back to my point and close this out as I'm already over time to simply say what better way could you spend your time than to seek the Father in prayer? And I want you to think about this as I contemplated early this morning and the thought came to me. One second spent in prayer is worth more than a lifetime of vainly seeking to do good without him. How could I say that? I think about three crosses on a hill called Calvary. And I think about how three men were affixed to those crosses and were dying. And on the middle cross was one who clearly demonstrated that he was more than mere man. The two on the outside crosses, malefactors, thieves, criminals, perhaps justifiably being put to death at that moment, but nevertheless, they're not innocent. Cursing him because that's what the natural inclination of humanity does toward someone who is altogether holy and righteous. That's the natural reaction. They were simply joining in with the crowd. And yet one of them, one of them had a change of heart. And in repentance, after looking at this one who was suffering horribly, who already had been beaten before he was nailed to that instrument of death with that crown of thorns crushed upon his brow and with a sign placed over his head mockingly declaring him to be king of the Jews, Somehow this man in repentance perceived, perhaps it was because even as Jesus was, was unjustly being subjected to this torture and horrible death, looked out upon the crowd and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Perhaps it was because of those utterances. We don't know how much knowledge he had of Jesus, but compared to what we now have because of the completed word of God, he knew very. And yet he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he said. How many seconds did it take to utter that prayer? You know, I can picture in eternity, perhaps, some judgment scene. When many a man and woman who has sought to live a good life, perhaps religious, being mindful that in the crowd that day that Jesus was dying, there were many a religious person who had given their lives over to very carefully keeping, at least as they interpreted it, the law and requirements of God day in and day out, yet having no regard for who God really is and refusing to recognize his son when he showed up on the scene. They, they had rejected God, but they were very religious and Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms that those types of people on that day will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. I can't imagine. But then there's this guy. They don't know him. He never went to a religious meeting. He never learned any of that. He simply perceived who Jesus was and in a matter of seconds said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And there he is. What right do you have to be here? I'm with him. Seconds spent in prayer. More valuable than a lifetime. In vain pursuit of reward apart from a saving relationship with Christ. I cannot begin to convey to you how important it is to yield up yourself to him and in prayer call upon him. Call upon Jesus. He promises not to turn any away. And I believe that with all of my heart because I'm standing here exhibit A, one who should have been turned away. And still I'm amazed that I have not been. And how that, even though we are in Christ, 
having trusted in him, have had imputed to us his perfect righteousness by virtue of that faith in him, yet we continue to sin. And how the Father promises. If you will but confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. As we seek him in prayer and as we ask, he doesn't turn us away. This year could be a year of unprecedented spiritual growth for you if you will but take advantage of this wonderful gift that God has given us wherein not only may we know him through his word as he reveals himself to us by grace but that we might have this relationship where we also are speaking to him our heavenly father who loves us he delights in you because of the one you're with remember I'm with him and being with him gains you access right to headquarters passing the line right up to the counter and he's glad you're there may God bless you to know that let's pray father in heaven lord we praise you and we thank you for your gracious goodness and kindness to us and we thank you that through your beloved Son himself, you've instructed us in this most important matter. So, Lord, grant that we might be a people who are before you continually, pouring out our hearts before you in every confidence, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you have determined to answer and provide for us good things. And so, our Father, bless us to be a people of prayer who not only profess to believe, but in prayer, demonstrating that we believe. And so we ask you to do a work among us beyond anything that I could possibly envision in this moment. May this word of yours continue to work deeply and profoundly within our hearts as we ask you, O oh Lord, to breathe on us. You are the one who breathed life into Adam. And may the Holy Spirit himself that breath, that life, continually infuse us with grace that we may be sanctified daily, even as we are justified, declared righteous through faith in Christ. Holy Spirit, work in us. And so we pray, breathe on us, breath of God, fill us with life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Join with me in singing that. That's our hymn as we stand together and conclude this service.
And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up unto you his countenance and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. And everyone said together. Amen.